I'm glad you've come tonight. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to get to, to gather on a, a special service like this in order to reflect on the cross of Christ. And as you can tell, the room is different. The lights are dim. The, the tone of tonight, it, it will be a lot more uh, somber and reflective as we meditate on what really was the darkest moment in all of history, and yet it, it brings us the best news. We, we call it Good Friday because of this, and, and it's an interesting paradox for us. But I'm glad that you've come today to reflect and to think about these things with me. On Sunday, when we come back together, it'll be a totally different scene here. It'll be exciting. It'll be celebratory and joyous. And, and we'll come in and we'll have uh, donuts and coffee and, and treats to eat in the morning. And then we'll have Bible classes. And we'll be excited and, and we'll worship in here the risen Savior. And we'll celebrate the conquering of death. And then we'll go outside and we'll have an Easter egg hunt. It, it'll, be, it'll be a wonderful, joyous expression. But tonight, it, we're not quite there, to, to get to Sunday and to feel the fullness of Sunday, we have to, to really understand the events of Friday. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about how the Old Testament, it foreshadows the meaning of the life and the death of Jesus. And, and tonight, I want us to, to bring all of that together as we've talked about him as the Lamb of God. But before we, we do that, I, I thought what would be fun tonight would be to, to see again how the whole Bible points us to this one story of Jesus, and, and everything kind of draws forward in this way, and, and I wanted the kids to be able to see it tonight before this sermon. And so, kids, if you would come up here with me, I've got, I've got a book I'd like to spend just a few minutes reading. Come up here and sit up here. I've got pictures. I understand this is some of our favorite books. So come sit up here. Come on, come on up, guys. You can come sit with me. I've got nice pictures for us to look at. In this little book called The Garden, The Curtain, and The Cross. Do you know this book? Are you excited? All right. So I've got pictures here, and I'm going to read to you how this book the story of the Bible all points us to this moment we've come to celebrate tonight and then again on Sunday. A very long time ago, right here in this world, there was a garden. In the garden, everything was wonderful. The world was full of laughing and playing and smiling and fun. There was nothing bad ever, and there was no one sad ever. And best of all, God was there. Hello, Adam. Hello, Eve. He had made it all, and he was in charge of it all, and he loved it all. People could see God, and they could speak to God, and just enjoy being with God. It was wonderful to live with God. But then one day, the people did a terrible thing. They decided they didn't want to do what God said. They decided they wanted a world without God in charge. God calls this sin. Sin spoils things. So sin has no place in God's wonderful garden. God said to the people, you can't live with me in my garden anymore. And so he sent them outside. To show the people that they had to stay outside, God put some warrior angels in front of the garden. These angels were like a big keep out sign. Now, things were sometimes bad, and people were sometimes sad. But people still kept sinning because they didn't want God to be in charge. So no one could come into God's wonderful place. God said, because of your sin, you can't come in. God wanted people to remember, it's wonderful to live with him, but because of your sin, you can't come in. So he told the people to build a special building called his temple, where he would live. In the middle of the temple, there was the most wonderful place in the world, the place where God was, where nothing bad and there was nothing sad. It was very exciting. But then God told the people to put a big curtain around the wonderful place. The curtain had pictures of warrior angels on it. It was a big keep out sign. For hundreds of years, the temple curtain reminded people that God said, it's wonderful to live with him, but because of your sin, you can't come in. Babies, kept, babies became grown-ups, and they had babies, and they had babies who became grown-ups and had babies, and those babies became grown-ups who had babies, and hundreds and summers and winters passed by, and the keep out curtain stayed in the temple. Then one day, God the Son came to live in this world as a person. He was called Jesus. Jesus always did what God said, and Jesus never sinned. 
Jesus visited the temple where the keep out curtain hung. Jesus knew that things were sometimes bad and sometimes sad. Jesus said that God had sent him to open the way back to God's wonderful place where there would be nothing bad and no one sad, but people still didn't want to let God be in charge. So they decided to put Jesus on a cross to die. It was the most bad that had ever happened, and it was the most sad day of all time. But Jesus had a plan. He had always planned to die on the cross. What a strange plan. Why would God's son plan to die? On the cross, Jesus took our sin. All the bad things we do and all the sad things they cause, Jesus took them all from us. And when he did, something amazing, astonishing, astounding happened. The curtain tore. God had ripped up the keep out sign. God's wonderful place is open again. Because Jesus died, we can go in. After Jesus died, his friends put him in a tomb. They were very sad. For two days, nothing happened. Then, the next morning, Jesus' friends went to see his body in the tomb, and it wasn't there. A little later on, Jesus' friends were all together, and suddenly, Jesus was there alive. Suddenly, his friends weren't sad. Now, they were so, so happy God had brought Jesus back to life so that he could live in God's wonderful place forever. And Jesus has sent everyone an invitation to come and live with him there too. He tells us, God says it's wonderful to live with him. Because of your sin, you can't come in. But I died on the cross to take your sin. So all of my friends can now come in. We can live with God forever. There will be nothing bad and no one sad. We will see God and speak to God and just enjoy being with God as he planned. It will be wonderful to live with him. And it's all because of Jesus. We will say every day, thank you, King Jesus. You're amazing. And you can start to say that today. That's what this whole weekend for us is about. This message of Jesus' great plan to die and to come back to life. And tonight we're going to talk about that and some of the things that we talk about may be really, really sad. Because on Friday when Jesus died on the cross, it was sad. But on Sunday, we'll celebrate that he is now alive. Let's pray together, and then I'll send you back to your parents, okay? Father, thank you for this great plan that you have had from the beginning of the world when you made everything good and right. And sadly, sin came and broke it all. And here we are today living in a place where people are sometimes bad and we are often sad. And yet we know you have a plan. So this weekend, Lord, as we think about the death of our Savior Jesus, as we celebrate and look forward to experiencing the power of his resurrection on Sunday, help us to believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, that we can be invited in to be with you forever and ever, where there is nothing bad and nothing sad. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus, and everyone said, amen. 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 You guys can go back to your seats. So this evening, what I want us to do in our time together tonight is I want us to step back once again, to step back into the Old Testament era, and I want us to take our place looking at the people of Israel, God's people, before they came to the land of Israel, all the way back to when God's people were held captive in the land of Egypt under the rule of Pharaoh, a hard-hearted king who was in rebellion to the one true God, who refused to obey God and let God's people go. If you have your Bibles this evening, you can turn to Exodus chapter 12. We'll start there tonight. If you're using the one in the pew in front of you, you can turn to page 64 and find our text right there. If you don't own a Bible, I'd love to give you one so you can take that one from the pew there. Come see me afterwards and I'll give you one to have of your own. In Exodus chapter 7, God began to deal with the rebellion and the resistance of Pharaoh by sending the the very famous now plagues upon Egypt. Time after time after time, God displayed his power was greater than the false deities, the false gods, the idols of the Egyptians. But every time God would send a plague and Pharaoh would say, okay, I'll do what you want, His hard heart would be revealed as soon as God lifted the plague, and again, Pharaoh would refuse to obey God. 
And so from Exodus 7 to where you are in Exodus chapter 12, God over and over displays his might and his power. And finally in Exodus 12, God speaks to Moses and Aaron. After nine devastating plagues, we read this in Exodus 12, 3. To Moses, he says, tell the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for every household. He goes on to say that this lamb, it shall be a lamb without blemish, a male who is a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of their houses. So this this little lamb that they are told to take into their homes was not to be kept as a pet. It was to stay for four days until on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, according to the Jewish calendar, this little lamb was to be killed. Its blood was to be spilled, it was to be taken and put over the entrance of the home. And that blood, those who applied that blood in obedience to God and this command, they would be spared, they would be passed over the judgment that God was bringing as this final penalty, this final curse upon the Egyptians. And then God told them, after they have applied the blood, there was more for them to do. If you look at verse 8 of Exodus 12, it says, Then the people shall eat the meat of the lamb that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat the lamb. These people were to have this special meal together that night after they had sacrificed the lamb. They were to eat some of this body that was slain for them, along with the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs that would remind them of how sad and how bitter and how costly salvation was for them. The cost was death of an innocent little lamb, right? And from that night onward, the people of Israel were told that every single year they were to remember these great events that God had done by eating this same meal year after year on the 14th night of the same month every year year. Verse 14 tells us, God said, this day shall be for you a memorial day. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, a statute forever. You shall keep this day as a feast. Now from Exodus 12, we'll come forward to the New Testament. In Luke chapter 22, we read this during Jesus's final week of life. The day came of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent two of his disciples, Peter and John, ahead, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. After they had done, as Jesus told them and prepared the meal, we read in verses 14 to 16, When the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I want you to notice those words from Jesus tonight. It's crucial to understand this meal that had been observed, it had been eaten by Jewish people generation after generation after generation for far over a thousand years. Jesus says, this meal, this moment, this act of remembrance that you have taken was only a foreshadow of something else. It was an event that needed a fulfillment. It was something that was never meant to terminate and be the point in and of itself. It was to to make the people look and long for something better, something greater. We'll come back to that meal in a few minutes at the end of the events of that night. But I want us to see what takes place after this meal that Jesus shared in observance of all these things, following all the way back to Exodus chapter 12 and the institution of the Passover. Turning over to the Gospel of Mark in chapter 14, we read that Jesus and his followers, after they had finished the Passover meal, sung a hymn and then went out to the Mount of Olives. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very greatly distressed and troubled. He said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to the point of death. Remain here and watch. Going just a little further, he fell onto the ground and prayed that if possible, this hour might pass from him. 
This last year, at the, at the end of the year in November, I, I had that opportunity to go to Israel on the, the study trip. And, and on one of our days, we began the day by starting out on the top of the Mount of Olives. We were overlooking Jerusalem from the east, and, and from there, we proceeded to walk down this same path that Jesus and the disciples would have walked down that very night. Down the hill to a garden area, to a place that is just like Gethsemane, where Jesus was. And I sat there in the garden on a rock, the, the same way Jesus sat in that garden that night and prayed. And as I sat there in this garden, I could look up through the trees and I could see before me the city gates where you would enter in to Jerusalem. I could see off to my left how around the old city walls was the western hill where I knew the high priest's home was, where Jesus would be taken later that night after praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. I could see across to the right where the hill of Golgotha was, where I knew Jesus would be crucified later that night after he prayed in that garden, as I did that night. And what was so striking to me was as I sat there looking at the scene before me, knowing what was to take place, the reality was Jesus this very night sat in the garden in prayer and when he looked up, saw the same things I saw and knew the same things I knew. He knew what was to happen. The prayers of Jesus in the garden that night were full of knowledge of what was about to take place. It's why Mark tells us that Jesus prayed this, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. This cup that Jesus speaks of here, this imagery he draws on in this prayer to the Father, is described for us in the Bible as the cup of God's wrath. In this cup is mixed every single sin every rebellious act, every assault upon God's sovereignty, every dismissal and rejection of God's kindness and love and grace from his people, from every nation and language and tribe and tongue, from every moment in history, all of that is put into this cup and mixed with the wrath of God for sin. Jesus understood clearly what the events of that night would require of him. He understood clearly what this cup of God's wrath was. And knowing that, knowing that this cup must be drank, knowing that he must drink it himself, he must deal with these sins and this wrath of God towards sins. He must endure it. He must pay this price if there is to be any hope of salvation for his people at any point in history. And Jesus says, for our sake, that he understands what is to come and then demonstrates his resolute commitment to taking the cup willingly. Father, he prays, if there is another way, remove this cup from me. But knowing full well there is no other way, that this is the plan that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have set in motion from before time began, Jesus says, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus expresses in the garden perfect obedience to the Father, and perfect willingness to drink this cup of wrath for his people. Even in the midst of this being the truly darkest moment in all of history, as Jesus could look up and see the places where everything would transpire that very night, knowing everything that would happen to him, he willingly accepted this was the price he had come to pay. This is what he had to do because you and I, his people, could never do this on our own. So Jesus pressed in that night. He came to fulfill the meaning and the purpose of the Passover events that had been going on since the time of Exodus 12. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he stepped in for you and for me. The gospel accounts tell us the events that took place next. Judas, who was one of the men who had been with Jesus for the last three years as one of his disciples, was a man who had really only been playing at this, pretending 
looking to those who looked in as if he was one of the followers, but in his heart, he never truly loved Jesus. He never obeyed Jesus. He never understood why Jesus did the things he did. He never grasped the purpose of Jesus' life, and he never believed what Jesus taught. Judas was like so many people today. People who wanted Jesus to be something else, to do something else, to provide for him something other than what Jesus had come to do. Judas wanted riches. He wanted success. He wanted fame and glory and power. And so for three years, he followed Jesus, thinking Jesus has come as the Messiah, which I believe means he'll come as a lion, a conqueror, a powerful one, and he will depose those in authority. And if I'm with him, if I'm on his side now, then I will gain myself. I will gain power. I will gain prestige. I will gain prosperity. I will be blessed. I'll be elevated. And at the end of these three years, Judas finally understood what has true of Jesus from the start. What John the Baptist, as I said last week, proclaimed Jesus' first advent, his incarnation, his first coming into this world, and his life and his ministry in Israel at that time, all those years ago, was not Jesus coming as the lion. But he had come to be the innocent, pure, perfect, sacrificial lamb of God. And when Judas finally understood Jesus wasn't going to do the things he wanted Jesus to do, he left him. He went to the temple guard and he traded Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And that night in that garden, Judas came back with a mob of soldiers and they arrested Jesus. The disciples were overwhelmed with fear that night. They ran and they hid, abandoning the one they swore they wouldn't do that to. And the soldiers took Jesus down the hill, around the old city walls, to the western hill, to the high priest's home, where they put Jesus into a stone pit in the ground, a place I was able to go to and stand at this last year as well. Luke tells us in that pit, Jesus was blindfolded, he was beaten, he was mocked by those who were keeping watch over him, and I stood right there in the place where Jesus was. From that pit, he was taken up to the high priest's court. And in front of this great group of religious leaders, lies and accusations and falsehoods were leveled at him. And for a long time, in the midst of all of that, Jesus said absolutely nothing, gave no answer to any of the lies said about him. He embodied perfectly the prophetic image of Isaiah 53, 7, which tells us that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Those words from the prophet Isaiah are written 700 years before Jesus was born, but describe his actions this night perfectly. And because of that, you need to see this was the purpose. This was the reason Jesus had come to be this, the lamb of God who would die for the sake of his people. Accusation and lie after lie thrown against him. Eventually, Mark tells us this. The high priest stood up in the midst of them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Finally, Jesus answered. He said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This response from the mouth of Jesus was plain to those who heard it. The religious leaders understood exactly what Jesus was saying when he said that he was the Son of Man, when he said he would be seated at the right hand of power and he would be coming one day on the clouds from heaven. They understood he was referring to the powerful prophetic promise of Daniel 7, 13, and 14 in which God himself says he will come. So Jesus clearly, plainly declares to those listening to him that night, he is God. Anyone who tells you Jesus never claimed to be God is dead wrong. 
He did right here in front of these religious rulers. They knew it. They understood exactly what he was saying. And their response was to cry out, blasphemy, you are a man claiming to be God. And the irony of the situation was they rejected and insulted and mocked him. But that's who he really was, God in the flesh. These religious leaders who said they served God, they worshipped God, they were his, his representatives upon earth, they missed it when God himself stood in front of them. Because they could not understand what Judas could not understand. Jesus had not come as the lion that they were expecting. He had come to die as the lamb of God. Because these religious leaders hated that idea so much, They disbelieved and did not want to to trust in Jesus so much that they decided the way to end this night would be to kill this man who stood before them. So they sent Jesus off to Pilate. Pilate sent him to Herod. Herod sent him back to Pilate. Jesus ran around, mocked, beaten throughout this night. Eventually, Pilate gives in to the crowds and the will of the religious leaders. And Jesus is led out of the city gates to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, by Roman soldiers who had mocked him and beaten him so severely by, the, by this point of the night, Jesus' body was so broken and bloody and weak, he could not even carry his own cross up the hill to where they would kill him. A man called Simon from Cyrene was grabbed from the street, forced to carry the cross of Jesus for him. When they finally reached the site, Roman soldiers took nails and drove it through Jesus' hands and feet and lifted him up on a rough wooden cross, feet above the ground where everyone would see him. And there, about 9 a.m. on Friday morning, hung the God of all creation, the one who had come to save his people, finally fulfilling the purpose for which he had come. For three hours, Jesus hung on the cross there. At noon, God caused the sky to turn black. Darkness covered the face of that place as Jesus was there suffering as the sacrifice for sin. At three o'clock that afternoon, hanging there upon the cross, the Apostle John gives us the account of what happened. In chapter 19, verse 30 of his gospel, he tells us of the very final words that Jesus spoke from that cross. In a loud cry, right before his death, he hung there and said in Greek one simple word, which in English for us is three. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Tetelestai, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. And the Son of God died. He declared in those final moments the work which had been the plan from all eternity past was now complete. Finished. No more to do. His mission was accomplished and it was. He had come for this purpose to suffer and to die in the place of his people to drink the cup of God's wrath towards sin so that his people from every tribe and language and nation from all points in history could be saved by this one work. Jesus accomplished it. He finished what he had come to do. But the gospel stories don't end there. And John doesn't move immediately from that moment to the glory of Sunday. He tells us instead in John chapter 19, verses 31 to 34, these important details to help us connect back to where we started this evening. Since it was the day of preparation for the Passover... And so that the bodies would not remain on the crosses on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that the legs of the men being crucified might be broken, and that they may be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first criminal and of the other one who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once out came blood, and water. These things, John tells us, took place that the scriptures might be fulfilled, that not one of his bones shall be broken. Why does John, 
Why does John pause in this story, this, this most important moment in all of history, to give us these details? Why does he reference the scripture, and where in the scripture does it refer to the fact that these bones shall not be broken in him? It takes us all the way back to where we started this evening in Exodus chapter 12. In verse 48, or 46 rather, of that passage, speaking of the Passover lamb, God tells the people that when the lamb was to be killed, it was to not have any of its bones broken. John is making this connection for you and I right here, that Jesus' death as the lamb of God meant he was then the perfect final Passover lamb that needed to be sacrificed. Jesus is the perfect Passover lamb. It means no longer do little lambs need to be slain as thousands and thousands of them were for years upon years upon years in the sacrificial system. No, Paul will later write for us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 that Christ is our Passover lamb who has been sacrificed. In the book of Hebrews, it will be told to us that Jesus has now appeared once at the end of the ages to put away all sin by the sacrifice of himself. And in Hebrews 10, 10, it says that this offering of the body of Jesus Christ was done once for all. The Apostle Peter declares then that salvation can only come through one way when you and I are ransomed from the futile ways that we have inherited from our forefathers. Not with perishable things like silver or gold, but rather with the precious blood of Christ, that of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Perfect. His perfect blood is what saves you and I. This is what Jesus came to do. This is why he had come, to to accomplish this work as the Lamb of God who would be slain, who would be sacrificed, so that by his blood there would be a covering for the sins of his people who would trust in him, that they would be saved from the wrath of God, that now the wrath that you and I deserve would pass over us and be paid by him. So tonight, knowing this story, hearing it yet again to refresh our minds then why this night, these events are the most important thing in all of history, we're going to take a few moments to worship and to respond to Jesus. Not to rush too quickly yet to the glory of Sunday, but but to look upon the darkness of that Friday, to think about the cross itself, to feel the weight of what took place there that you and I could be redeemed and we could be saved from our sins. Choir, if you will come and prepare to lead us in our first song. We're just going to take the next 10 to 15 minutes here. And over these next four songs, we'll have this opportunity to pray and to reflect and to to feel these deep, rich words and the glory of what it is that Jesus did for us on that cross. That we would stand in awe of him together tonight. Let's pray together. Let's worship together in these moments. You can be seated this evening. That last meal of Jesus' life, when he took that Passover meal with his disciples that evening, he, he radically reoriented that event into something new, a new ordinance, a new practice for his people to begin to participate in from that night forward. This meal would become not just a a foreshadow, but now a reminder of what it was that Jesus had accomplished, what Jesus had done in paying the price for our salvation, how he had become the lamb slain to fulfill the point of the Passover. In the original Passover meal, as we heard tonight, there was to be unleavened bread and bitter herbs that were eaten alongside the lamb that was sacrificed for them. But Jesus, on that final night, after having taken the meal that one final time, instead just took two elements. He took the bread and the cup because he himself would become the lamb and he himself would pay the bitter price of bringing salvation to his people. And through these two symbols, he instituted a new practice of remembrance for you and I of what it is that he had accomplished. For those of us who are Christians tonight, And you don't have to be a member of our church to take the Lord's Supper with us tonight. We will celebrate this act as an act of remembrance. But we must understand what we are doing tonight. 
As I always remind you, the elements before us are not transformed in any way. There's no ritual that will make these things anything other than bread and juice tonight. What we're about to do is to follow the command of the words of Jesus, to eat these powerful, illustrative symbols to remind us of Jesus' death, of his fulfillment of the point of the Passover, to remind us of the price he paid upon the cross when he died as the true Lamb of God. So if you're not a Christian here tonight, then, then let these things just, just go by you. There's no extra uh, grace or merit that you earn by partaking of them. In fact, to, to eat of these things without true faith in Jesus Christ is just a sin one day that you will pay for. But for those of us who are Christians, we eat this in faith, believing that these don't save us, but the work of Christ on that cross nearly 2,000 years ago, that is what saves us. For us, this is a moment of being filled and reminded once again of the goodness in the grace of our God. So Eric and Reed, Dale, Jason, if you guys will come this evening, you're going to assist in serving us these elements. These things are symbols that point us to what we have heard of in this story tonight, that God the Son took on human flesh and he came as the Lamb of God who died in the place of sinners. He came to drink the cup of God's wrath, that it would be taken by him so that you and I would not have to bear it ourselves. As we're served this evening, I've asked Wendy to sing. You guys can begin a special song that the words of this song, as you hear them and see them on the screen tonight, will help focus your mind and your heart even more fully on what it is that Jesus did and the price he paid on our behalf. These items that we have in our hands tonight have their true significance as we see them in light of that Good Friday on Golgotha's Hill. They point us to the meaning of what it is that Christ endured. These words that Jesus spoke that night now give us greater encouragement and greater clarity as to his purpose. In Mark 14, 22, after they had celebrated the Passover meal, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This little bit of unleavened bread that you and I hold in our hands tonight is a symbol of the broken body of Christ. He was beaten and bruised and ultimately killed for our sake. And the suffering and the physical pain that he bore on the cross should never be forgotten or minimized by us as his followers. It is because of the spiritual work that was accomplished through the breaking of his body that you and I can see this day as good news for us. We don't eat lamb together tonight as the Passover meal required, but simply this piece of bread to remind us that Jesus, our Passover lamb, has been killed once and for all. Let's take the bread together. And then Jesus took a cup. When he had given thanks for it, he gave it to his followers and they all drank of it. He said to them, this now is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. That cross where Jesus hung was a bloody place. His life was poured out there on the cross, the shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Everything was put upon him that night. From the littlest of lies that we tell to the deep harboring of hatred we keep hidden away in our hearts to every moment of unsubmissiveness and rebelliousness to God, it's all there put upon Jesus and the price for all of it was his blood shed for our sin that we could be forgiven. Though this cup is only juiced tonight, it's a powerful symbol of the cost of your salvation found in the Lamb of God. Let's take the cup together. As we heard, even in our story tonight that we read with the kids, the story of Jesus doesn't end upon that cross. The events of Good Friday see Jesus dead, slain as the true Passover lamb, buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and his followers mourning and weeping at his death. But Jesus had repeatedly made a prophetic promise about these events before they ever came to pass. 
In Luke chapter 18, verses 31 to 33. Taking the twelve aside, Jesus said to them, See, we are now going up to Jerusalem, and everything that has been written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. But on the third day, he will rise. Jesus knew before the garden what was to come. He saw it all with absolute clarity, and he said exactly here what would happen when he came to Jerusalem, didn't he? And he promised he would rise again. On that third day, the Sunday following this Good Friday, his sacrifice as the Lamb of God would see him rise in victory, truly the Lion of Judah. If you'd stand with us tonight, we're going to sing one last chorus of hope. Verse 4 of the final song we sang this evening as Wendy led us in those words, Come, behold the wondrous mystery. In verse 3, we sang this, Come, behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Now, if you will, let's lift our voices in anticipation, in a foretaste of what Sunday is all about. And once again, let's behold the wondrous mystery in verse 4 of this great song. Again, we will gather on Sunday morning as we always do at nine o'clock and we'll come together with joy to celebrate the risen Savior. Let me pray for us as we go. Father, we thank you for this grand plan that has been unfolded that we tonight can stand here and look back upon with joy in our hearts, with understanding that the events of that dark, dark Friday on the hill of Golgotha means for us right now good news. It means for us salvation from our sins, that you, Lord Jesus, would come and be slain in our place as the Lamb of God today gives us hope. It gives us forgiveness. It gives us peace. And now, as we eagerly, longingly await coming together on Sunday morning to celebrate your resurrection, I pray for every heart, for every soul here, Lord, that you would draw close to us and focus us in on the beauty and the grandeur of you, our great Savior, King, and God. It's in your powerful, mighty, living name that we pray, Lord Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I'll see you Sunday morning.